So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Lou Sultan. Uh, most of you may know me, although with COVID, you never know who hasn't met me yet. Um, I direct our STEPS uh, group, and in particular, the Energy Futures group within that. And uh, I'm stepping in for Austin Brown today, who's our director of the Policy Institute, um, who in, I think was instrumental in inviting our speaker today. And unfortunately, he's very involved with transitions right now and helping out with, uh, with that, with the Biden transition team a little bit. And meanwhile, we, we move ahead here and I'm very uh, glad to welcome Natasha Vidangos uh, from uh, the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, she's a vice president of research and analysis there. And she directs the Alliance's research priorities and oversees strategic initiatives, including establishing networks among private sector, governments and advocacy groups to define and advocate for the evolving opportunities for energy efficiency in a transforming energy sector. Uh, she leads the Alliance to Save Energy's 50 by 50 transportation initiative, the Energy Efficiency Impact Report, and the Alliance's new initiative in 2020, the Active Efficiency Collaborative. So a lot of interesting initiatives going on there. And prior to joining the Alliance, Natasha served as one of the founding members of the Energy Resources Bureau at the US Department of State serving as senior power sector advisor, senior Western hemisphere energy officer, and a science policy fellow through the American Association of the Advancement of Science. She also collaborated with the Department of Energy Office of Energy and Policy Systems Analysis and was the lead drafter for North American Power Systems Integration for the second installment of the Quadrennial Energy Review. She holds a PhD in biophysical chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, where she was an NSF graduate fellow and a BS in chemistry from Yale and she was listed among public utility fortnightly's fortnightly under 40 in 2019. So, I mean, if you don't end up involved with this new administration, I'll be surprised, Natasha, but we won't, uh, we won't say much about that, but we're very happy to welcome you today. And uh, I think with no further ado, I'll hand it over and take it away. Thank you so much, Lou. That was very, very kind. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. I'm really excited to be here. Everybody hearing me okay? Just quick check before I launch. Good. I do. Okay, great. We'll take it. All right, I'll go ahead and kick it off. So first I'll say a couple words about the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, so, you know, so you know who we are. Uh, we are a DC based nonprofit that envisions a world that uses energy more productively to achieve economic growth, a cleaner environment and greater energy security, affordability and reliability. Uh, we've been around for 40 years. We were founded in the same year that the Department of Energy was founded and often for the same reason, which was the oil crisis. Um, so we lead initiatives that try to drive technological innovation and energy efficiency across all sectors. Uh, to put it very simply, we try to move all of the pieces of the puzzle so that energy efficiency wins. And we define energy efficiency very broadly. Um, we don't just think about what a lot of people see as energy efficiency, where you just change one widget for another widget. We think really about how do we optimize energy across the way we use energy across our energy systems, whether that's power, whether that's transportation, and increasingly those two are starting to blend together. So this is our mission and vision. The Alliance has, um, actually I, I passed there, the Alliance has an a set of honorary advisors uh, who are sitting members of Congress. Um, so these folks help advise us and help serve as our champions for energy efficiency. And you'll notice that it is a very bipartisan group. That is not an accident. It is also central to the foundation of our mission and vision. We are a bipartisan organization. For the most part, we only support legislation when it is bipartisan. And energy efficiency for a very long time has been a place where bipartisanship really is possible and meaningful. I have a quick slide here on our board of directors. You see it's got folks from a great diversity of different sectors, um, utilities, technology companies, a lot of private sector, but also public interest organizations help support our mission and help give us guidance. And we also have a roster of about 120 different associate members um, who, you know, who help support us in our overall mission and work with us together in petitioning Congress and educating in creating initiatives that try to move energy efficiency forward. So in designing today's conversation, 
I was looking a little bit at the other seminars that you have all seen, and I know a fair bit about your institute because it is highly influential in the circles in which I travel, and it is very effective at what it does. So you, you're you coming from a place where um, everybody will know the name of your, your organization and really see you as the next set of top minds for transportation. And I was thinking, what is one thing that perhaps other speakers haven't covered um, that I could possibly impart to you. Uh, so I come back to the title of my talk, which is creating a shared mission in a world of agendas. I'd like to try to dive just a little bit into some of that murky world of the politics and how it is felt for me personally doing this kind of work, especially in coalition building at this current moment in time. So here you see a little figure with the, the policy making cycle. It starts with problem identification and agenda setting, policy formulation, decision-making, policy implementation, policy evaluation, and then you're right back at the top and you keep going on problem identification all over again. Um, so in this particular sphere, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna make this a bit more interactive than perhaps other seminars have been for you all. Please feel free to go to the chat box uh, and respond if I have questions that I'm throwing out there. And I'll just sort of keep an eye on the chat box and keep this conversational. So. If you think about one area of potential policy research is how you prioritize different problems, which step in the policy making cycle do you think that is relevant to? Prioritization of problems. Type something in. I'll wait and see if anybody's up oh, taking it. Agenda, setting the agenda. I have one vote for agenda setting. Any others? Problem identification. Identification, identification, right. So I read a headline the other day that said the US government might shut down again at the end of the year. And that shutting down, one could say, is also a feature of the prioritization of the problems. There is a prioritization that shutting down the government is more important than the political calculus of coming to an agreement. So one could actually say that Prioritization is really obviously important in problem identification. It's really obvious in agenda setting, but it also matters a lot when you're actually formulating the policy because very often you have a longer list than you can implement. It makes a huge difference in decision-making because when you actually talk to policymakers, oftentimes the best you can do is get in and give them that elevator pitch. It's important in policy implementation because you often run out of the funding to do the level of policies that you would like to do. And then when you evaluate the policies, there is a prioritization around how you evaluate it, which will very likely shift how that policy looks for future. So you can, I can play a similar game uh, with coalition building. You could say that coalition building looks very much like something that would appear in the policy formulations part of the conversation, maybe decision-making. Um, but there are huge coalitions that talk a lot in energy efficiency about how you evaluate programs, uh, depending on the metrics you use and the rubric you use to evaluate programs to get very different answers. And there are coalitions that would like to see it done a different way than the way it is being done now. So really my point with this slide is to show you that some of the aspects which tend to get binned in universities and specific categories in management programs are actually infuse the entire process. Um, and the same is true also for you know, thought leadership, really getting great ideas out there. there it also is true for research and analysis. Uh, many of you are gonna become some of the great minds in research and analysis in this space. And very often it's not just figuring out what the problem is, it's figuring out every step of this process. There are ways that you can help all across the board. And at the end of the day, one of the most effective and one of the hardest things to do that really accelerate the circle is changing public opinion. If I, um, when I first went into the federal government, uh, I received a training in which somebody stood up and said, okay, well, you know, for anybody who was alive in the nineties, this is, this is probably not, not the age group that I'm talking to today, but for those of us who were alive in the nineties, um, there was a really terrible song called the Macarena, which came out, it had a little dance that went with it. And, um, for some reason from one day to the next day, it was extremely popular and suddenly from you know, the day that you heard the song the first time, the second day you heard it 10 times on the radio, and the third day everybody seemed to be doing it at birthday parties, at bar mitzvahs, at, uh, at weddings, at any event, suddenly the Mark Rana was everywhere. This is how Congress works. 
that an idea doesn't necessarily have to be a great idea for it to catch on fire and suddenly be the idea that everybody is talking about overnight. So if you can change public opinion, that is perhaps the most powerful tool in the box, but it also is often the hardest. So some of the questions that I'd just like to touch on quickly, and we'll, we'll do a little interactive exercise at the end of this session. We're gonna use the last sort of half hour um, to do a little exercise. So um, stay tuned for that, for those of you who are the students who are registered. Question is really what, what makes change happen? How can you resolve intractable problems? What's stopping us when we aren't able to resolve those intractable problems? Is it just that people just don't want to see that the right answer is there? Or is it that there's something in the system that's jamming the works that's making it hard to get there? There's also a very real difference between politics and policies. Obviously they intersect often. They are highly influencing one another. Uh, but with politics, very often you need to have a really clear message of what you stand for and why people should support you to do it. With policies, you often need to have great nuance and care and caution for applying a very complex tool to which, which is often a little bit imperfect to a complex outcome. And one can also say that politics is messy. It's often uh, compared to making sausages. Um, that's true too. Uh, but very often in terms of the political sphere, you have to have a very clear message. So questions that folks in my world are asking themselves on a daily basis, sometimes down to the smallest decisions are, should we be more assertive or should we be more incremental? Is it better for us to try to make an existing policy better or do we need to leapfrog where we were previously and just try to go harder and faster? So I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about a specific initiative that I've led at the Alliance. It's called the 50 by 50 Transportation Commission. This, this year it had a slight name change, uh, getting called the 50 by 50 Action Network. Um, but it all started in 2017 when we formed the Alliance's commission and identified a goal to cut transportation energy use by 50% by 2050, hence the 50 by 50 goal. And those of you who are really following target setting and big goals that governments or, or uh, private sector organizations might be setting, 50 by 50 might not sound like a lot. If you're thinking about climate change and the urgency of it, 50 by 50 doesn't sound impressive, but we were talking at a national level. So imagining bringing the entire country to a place where especially highway transportation cuts energy use by 50% is really a very ambitious goal. So we were responding to a number of trends and this slide is a little bit old. It, it's from that time around 2017, 2018, but all of the trends are pretty much the same. Um, transportation was replacing power in the US as a top source of carbon emissions. Maryland, eight other states in DC agree to work together to curb transportation emissions. And I understand you had a, a seminar with Vicki earlier to talk about that particular work. After years of decline, US carbon emissions are rising again. Um, there's a regional approach to cap and trade. Greenhouse gas emissions accelerate like a speeding freight train. And if you wanna look at decarbonization, one of the first places you're gonna look is transportation. Um, and so here's the 2017 US greenhouse gas emissions uh, by sector from the EPA. And you can see that the transportation um, is a really significant portion of that pie. And then if you see the greenhouse gas emissions by source, you see again, um, the light duty vehicles, I believe light duty vehicles um, is really the highest level there. You've got 59% coming from light duty vehicles, medium and heavy duty trucks are 23% aircraft and others are smaller percentages overall. So really highway transportation and it's an enormous part of this picture. Other trend, oh, I skipped one. Other aspects that are driving a greater interest in transportation is, of course, congestion. Congestion is everybody's favorite bugaboo. Nobody likes congestion, no matter the political stripe or the position the person's in. If you want to talk about productivity, economic growth, jobs, quality of life, air pollution, carbon emissions, you name it, congestion is a terrible thing. Um, and so here are again, some, some articles that I just pulled from the web around the topic. Congestion emergency costs DC area drivers around $2,000 a year living outside DC. I can attest to the fact that traffic is terrible. It's getting worse. It costs Americans lots of hours. Um, there are anecdotes that it takes longer to get a, get a freight truck across the city of Chicago than it does to get them from LA to Chicago in the first place. And it's just expected to get a whole lot worse into the future. What do we do about that? Other trends, of course, are electrification. Fully electric cars are considered a whole lot more efficient than 
uh, regular internal combustion engine vehicles, which I'm calling ICEs. Um, I'm using numbers here from the Argonne National Laboratory GREET model. Uh, I suspect some of you will end up using that at some point in your time here. But the sector is really bringing new players into transportation. All of a sudden, power electric power utilities have a role in the transportation sector. And from a perspective of a coalition builder, that's actually a very meaningful change and very different. We also have charging companies, electricity developers, other sort of public infrastructure and folks interested in it like cities getting more and more involved in this space. And over on the right, I just wanted to highlight uh, a point that how you look at the data is very, very dependent on who you are. Um, so when looking at the chart on the right, this is actually a somewhat complex figure, uh, but the dark blue shows you uh, the BTU per miles on a pump to wheel basis. If you're just thinking about the energy that is being used once the car burns the fuel in the car, that's the pump to wheel basis. If you think about the entire life cycle of making that fuel, transporting it to the fueling station, getting it into the car, you can imagine there's a whole lot more energy that goes into that full life life um, life cycle process. It's called the well to wheel. So if you want to look at the um, energy consumption on a pump to wheel and well to wheel basis and the carbon emissions on a pump to wheel and well to wheel basis, you will find that electric vehicles have essentially zero emissions on a pump to wheel basis, but a lot more on a well to wheel basis because you have to count the power that the, the greenhouse gas emissions that came from the electricity that was generated. Um, we spent an awful lot of time talking about this chart with different stakeholders, including those who were in the natural gas industry, who felt that it would be unfair if we only judged electric vehicles based on the pump to wheel metrics, because that was ignoring the part of both the energy losses, which makes it less look less efficient, and the greenhouse gas emissions. So that was already one place where um, the different perspectives and the different agendas of different characters at the table made it so that the very numbers that we were looking at and were citing might have been different, even if they were all technically true. Another trend, one that you guys are um, in one of the foremost places of thought on is connected and automated vehicles. And this comes from an article from 2017. I know more research has done, been done since then, but the overarching message is that we have very little sense what automated vehicles are going to do to the overall energy use of the transportation sector. And um, I've heard ITS folks talk about the heaven and hell scenario where if everything lines up the right way, um, you could find that actually automated vehicles make the sector a whole lot more efficient if everything aligns in the wrong way where people are driving or you know, empty vehicles are roaming the roads all the time, that's a whole lot more complicated. So how does a policymaker approach this now when there are so many different variables for how that's going to unveil and there's so much uncertainty? So the main objectives of the overall initiative was to address this confluence of, tre of trends. We have existing challenges, there's cost, congestion, carbon emissions, there are inevitable changes like automation and changes in uh, um, information connected to technologies, sorry, information communication technologies. Um, and there is no single national vision for the future. Um, this is something that is actually a bit of a curiosity of the American system that we do not have a national energy plan. A lot of the leadership takes place at the state level and then the federal government also plays a leadership role in some areas, but the whole thing is not a completely national plan. So this was a collaborative effort to try to design some of the policy frameworks and establish a vision that is cohesive rather than fragmented or contradictory that articulates where we could go in the future. How can we achieve 50 by 50 as a community, as, as a collaborative and as a coalition? So we brought together um, a group of really great minds. It was co-chaired uh, by the president of Audi Amer of America and the president of National Grid US, uh, Mark Del Rosso and Dean Sievers. It was really important to us to have it led by an automaker and an, ele an electric utility. That was already a way of marrying those topics on electrification. And then we had a number of stakeholders from different organizations, including utilities, technology companies, uh, public sector um, companies that you've probably seen around like Proterra and Electrify America, um, New York Power Authority uh, and the NRDC. 
And we worked together to create a number of publications. We started with a white paper to kick off the effort. We organized large groups of stakeholders into different committees to do baseline reports in which we identified where the opportunities for a more optimized use of energy existed in light duty sector, heavy duty, non-road vehicles, which was primarily looking at ports and airports, which we saw as sort of a, a nexus of many different transportation modes, ICT shared mobility and automation, all the new stuff, um, and then enabling infrastructure, which primarily focused on electric vehicle charging infrastructure. From there, we worked with the group to get to consensus on a report full of policies on how you achieve 50 by 50 in all of those sectors. All of these reports are available at 50x50transportation.org. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of them in detail, but basically the overarching frame was that we have opportunities to transform, to innovate and to invest in the sector. Transformation is about addressing those opportunities for change that require a system level approach. We're coming to the point in digitalization, in electrification, beneficial electrification, the communication among all of these different pieces. We can talk much more seriously about how transit coordinates with the Ubers and Lyfts, how that coordinates with personal transportation, how that coordinates with freight traffic, how the electrification infrastructure feeds into all of that. Other section is innovating. There are areas where we really need to learn and we need to continue with research and development um, to try to plan for those challenges of the future. And then finally, investing is investing in the foundation to get us there. And for the investment section, we talked a lot about what it takes to get all of the vehicles on roads as efficient as they can be, from fuel economy standards to trying to increase the rate of vehicle turnover, to trying to move the next best vehicle in the case of light duty vehicles, that very often is an electrified vehicle. For the case of drayage trucks, that might be a hydrogen vehicle or some other alternative fuel. Try to find the best next step, whatever that may be, and don't get stuck in something that really is inefficient. And then finally, there was a special section devoted to electrification. Electrified vehicles are ahead above many of the other others in terms of their efficiency. And so that is an area that deserves some, some careful attention. The following year, um, there were jokes being made in DC that suddenly there was a great appetite to pursue infrastructure. And there was talk of an infrastructure package and some uh, talked about it really as an opportunity for roads and bridges. Some talked about it as an opportunity for clean transportation and the transition to electrification. Uh, but the beauty was in the eye of the beholder. It then became almost a running joke in this town. You see over on the right, um, there are a number of, if you just Google infrastructure week um, every week, you get these different lists, how it's a longstanding Washington punchline because week after week after week, it was announced by somebody that it was infrastructure week, week and there was the possibility of Congress passing a large package of infrastructure support or stimulus. Um, through all of this, our group uh, came together and once again, worked through consensus recommendations that try to look at the legislation that exists in the FAST Act, which is the main federal vehicle. It is a monolithic bill um, that does a lot of funding for transportation projects and try to look through and see what can we do to make this bill 50 by 50 ready. So we have a number of recommendations in that report as well that really talk about operationalizing those recommendations based on specific legislation. We also built the coalition larger. Uh, we had another category of supporting organizations um, where we basically exchanged data. We exchanged uh, lessons learned from our experiences. Uh, we spread around some of, the, some of the experiences that we'd had. And in some cases, we ended up collaborating, collaborating closely with a number of these organizations. So sometimes being inside the co collaboration was one thing that some organizations wanted. Others wanted just to be connected and they were different, but meaningful. So some other activities in addition to establishing policy recommendations, we also had a pretty, pretty good press presence. We, um, we did a lot of interviews, we did an audio episode, we tried to make sure that there was a, a good amount of talk in the energy press. Uh, we also conducted a number of congressional meetings where we took groups of folks from the 50 by 50 uh, coalition up to the House and Senate to talk about the importance of these recommendations and to lobby for them, to say, you know, we're at a time right now where it looks like nobody can agree on anything, but we, this very diverse group of stakeholders, agree on this. 
and it was a powerful message. A few other items. Uh, we also got involved in the energy efficient codes debate in trying to get an EV ready energy code passed into the interna international energy conservation codes model code process. If you're not familiar with this particular process, it's a somewhat Byzantine, um, Byzantine world in which there is an organization that every couple years decides what goes into a standardized building code. And based on what goes into that model building code, different states can choose to adopt the recommendations in the code. Um, so we were working very closely uh, with other partners in our network to try to pass an EV ready building code for residential and commercial. Um, in the end, we got excellent voting for the energy code that we had tried to pass, uh, but it was abruptly re removed from the package at the very last minute. Um, so it was another one of those examples where we had all of the pieces lined up, but at the end of the day, it seems that politics played a role in removing it at the very last minute. We also had roundtable discussions on some of the more challenging topics where there isn't a simple thing to lobby for in Congress. There is no one bill that will fix a particular problem, such as what is the future of the energy consumption on connected and automated vehicles? Um, and if you have very sharp eyes, you'll see that Austin was there um, and helping to work with us on that as well. So that's the main summary about the 50 by 50 initiative. And I'll just end with a few other of these general fuzzy insights. Um, there's always a great need for deep analysis that can be communicated simply. And I'd say that both parts of that sentence are important. Uh, one of the things that ITS has done very effectively is create these policy briefs that really get to the heart of an issue very quickly, um, but in a way that is also very rigorous and very meaningful. It's also important that stakeholders hear the right things at the right time. Having the right message is not enough. Very often, you have to cultivate a, a conversation with a stakeholder who's in a position of power to make sure that they see things your way at a time that they can really help and that they're really interested in your, in your message. Also flag that many critical stakeholders are not, not necessarily experts in their field. This was a bit of a surprise to me when I first went into the policy space. Um, and a great example is actually hill staffers. A lot of the people who run the hill and make the place tick and make it work are very young individuals who are just out of college. And they may suddenly inherit a portfolio where they're managing all energy for a specific committee. Um, but that means that they can be very quick on their feet and it's really important for the people talking to them to be able to be really clear and to the point. Finally, building support for ideas takes time. And sometimes when looking at choices to try to move the needle and try to make change happen, sometimes there are no obviously good options. And that is a very real part of the process. So that is the end of my structured remarks. Um, I'll give it back to Lou to take a number of questions, but I will flag that there will be a little exercise to see how you all do at trying to take on some of these challenging questions um, that we'll, we'll get to in a couple of minutes. But first, back to you, Lou. Okay, thank you, Natasha. That was great. Um, so, I, you your little uh, workshop uh, interactive thing. At, we'll do it at the end. So we should save what about fifteen minutes for that. Uh, I'd actually love more like twenty twenty five if possible, but obviously well, let's, let's spend possible. about twenty minutes. So you know, go to two thirty uh, on Q and A, and then we'll see where we go from there. So people should. I think the idea is that the students can put their questions in the chat box and then we can uh, you, you can unmute yourselves to ask but I'll call on you and other others can use the Q&A box and uh, we also could unmute people sometimes but feel free to get started asking questions and I have some but I'll hold off a little bit. Um, we have one um, from Tessura about different approaches to bring different stakeholders together. Do you want to ask that yourself Tessura? Um, okay. Um, hi, Natasha. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, so you spoke about, you know, building stakeholders with, you know, different interests with, and you mentioned utilities and, you know, transport companies and transits. I'm just curious, like, you know, there's some approaches, you know, incentivizing, giving like the carrots to bringing stakeholders together, but sometimes to really, you know, make them think about really making change or really you know, sitting down together, not just sitting together, but, you know, really investing in, you know, infrastructure and bringing complementary solutions. Um, I've seen legislation bring about 
changes sometimes. What do you think is the best approach? What does your experience tell you? Is there any other ways and means to do it? I'd say there are a lot of different different ways and styles, and it's very dependent on the group, of course. Um, in our transportation initiative, we actually did have pretty much all of those groups involved. Um, and it was interesting to see the dynamics among them. Obviously, when you have IOUs, there's a very large difference depending on the IOU that you point to. And um, they really can be opposite ends of the spectrum. And there are likely gonna be some who are just not interested in this conversation. And I think in that case, you have to think about building the coalition such that you are not including voices that just want to be there to be spoilers, because those do exist, um, those are real. Um, there are others who are interested, but a little bit cautious and concerned um, that sort of bad policies will result from, you know, from too much enthusiasm or a poorly designed outcome. And then there are those who are really rearing to go and want to be leaders and want to make it more aggressive and, and go further faster and be more excited. So there's a certain amount of work that goes into determining what is the right coalition to make sure you're in a space where you can have productive conversations. And ideally you have folks in sort of those latter two categories, you know, enough who are excited and energized, but who really believe in the value of reaching that consensus um, and others who are interested, but cautious, but can be persuaded if there are, there are opportunities to do it in a way that really seems effective for them. Maybe I'll just follow up on that and, and ask in particular, I mean, I'm looking at your coalition and all the different kinds of NGOs and, and whatnot, and they do they typically come at the issue of energy savings from, I mean, there, there are a number of different reasons why you might want energy savings. An obvious one is climate, but there are other ones. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are these different reasons and is everyone on the same page and does it affect the strategies much? And not everybody was in, in for it for the same reason. And it did not necessarily affect the strategy that much, which was interesting, right? If the, if the outcome is being pursued for different reasons, it isn't necessarily as, as important as if, the, if different outcomes were being pursued. Um, and of course, like the, there, are, there are devils in the details there. Once you actually start talking about specific policies and how you incentivize that outcome, um, there are some that are definitely more popular than others. Um, our group definitely was more interested in the carrots than they were interested in the sticks. And uh -huh. that would be different if we had had a different selection of stakeholders. Um, but for the most part, they saw this, I'd say almost all stakeholders around the table saw this in some form or another as a great booming market, which was a huge opportunity. It was coming no matter what we said about it. And they wanted to be at the forefront of it. And so, um, you know, incentivize, help us put ourselves into a position where we can help lead, lead this was kind of the, the overarching framework that we were working with. But it was a very, a very enthusiastic and very energetic one. And there was a lot of creativity around the table based on which sector and the individuals at the table. Okay. Um, let's see. Now there's one here from Trisha Ramadas. Do you want to ask it? Yes. Um... Hi, that was a great presentation. Um, so I was I was curious if you could speak more about um, like critical stakeholders who are not experienced in their field. And also just like a side note, I'm from Tampa. So I'm curious what all those pictures from Tampa were about. Yeah, no, oh, very nice. Um, yeah, so we, we host, I'll answer the second one first because it's quick. We hosted a workshop in Tampa talking about connected and automated vehicles. There's a great uh, pilot project in Tampa um, for the Tampa Expressway. We got photographs of ourselves standing in the middle of a highway um, that was completely empty and used for automated vehicle or connected vehicle testing. Um, so interesting place, great stakeholders, great people. Um, in terms of critical stakeholders, I mean, I would say that it, very often um, coming through an, an academic world, and as I said, you know, I, I was trained as a scientist and I would say in the hard sciences, there's kind of a view that until you've done something for a decade, you can't really say anything about it. And that, that couldn't really be more different than the world of policymaking as I see it in DC, where people shift chairs all the time. People who are in, you know, in a legal department one year might be in the communications department the next year. There are of course deep experts and they are out there. It's very, very diverse. But you very often come across a wide variety of expertise in any group of stakeholders. And so I think that really is relevant for 
anybody who's thinking to do serious research and analysis for the transportation field and talking about engaging policymakers and trying to influence policy. Because I think very often there's an assumption that everybody knows the same things, that some of those statistics that I showed at the beginning about the impact of the transportation sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, I suspect most people on this call have seen a slide similar to that many, many times. But one might be finding oneself talking to a political appointee in the Department of Energy who has never seen that slide and yet has a fair bit of power over the sector. And the same is true if one's talking to someone in Congress um, or you know, at a variety of other stakeholders as well. So it's just, it's worthwhile to keep in mind that good messaging and great clarity is really meaningful. Great, okay. Uh, we've got another one here from uh, Vishnu Vijay Kumar. Do you want to ask it, Vishnu? Yeah, thanks, Lou. Uh, thanks, Nata and Natasha, for the presentation. So the, my question is kind of um, uh, kind of very general. So what I want to know is that you come up with all this analysis, for example, the 50-50 analysis or something else, and you have a bunch of stakeholders who support you. So generally, what is the modus operandi for you people? Whom do you approach first? Do you approach the legislator directly or do you go to a separate route so that at the end of the day, you want this analysis to end up uh, in a meaningful policy? So what are the possible routes that you people generally take? That's a really great question. And the answer is that it's rather iterative, actually. Um, so Congress is uh, one of one of my favorite analogies is that it's a bit like sailing. Um, I don't know how many of you have sailed or wind sailed, um, but there's the concept of tacking in which if you wanna go from point A to point B, but the wind is not blowing from point A to point B, you let's say the wind is blowing this way instead of this way, you have to ride the wind in one direction and then turn your sail, ride it back and you zigzag in order to get where you need to go because you need to capture the wind in as much as it's carrying you roughly in the right direction and then keep adjusting course until you get there. I think that's actually a very good analogy. Um, there are different stages of developing uh, legislation in Congress. In this case, we have the transportation bill of the year. It was supposed to be passed last year, but it was punted to this year. Um, so it was previously called the FAST Act in the last authorization. Uh, this, this year, it looks like it's, it's sort of taking on moving, moving America forward. Um, but it's a, a whole host of bills that many people have been talking about for years and that adjusts and adapts existing bills that are already there. One never really gets the opportunity to sit down and write a completely empty bill on a blank page. Um, once in a while, there are opportunities, like if there's massive technological innovation or if there's a huge shift in the political powers of Congress and suddenly one political party is able to sort of go back to the drawing board and get everything they ask for. Otherwise, it's a continued, very careful process of negotiation. And once they've negotiated a position on something, it's very hard to just start from scratch. So the value of an initiative like this is trying to hit a couple different levels. One is articulating a vision, getting people excited, making it so that we're all talking about the fact that we have a huge opportunity to make transportation more efficient and it really benefits all of us and we should really get on that. The other is to talk at a much more tactical level of how do you get these things passed in Congress? What are the vehicles that move us in the right direction? Who are the people who have power over those vehicles? And how can we talk to them and persuade them that this really is, is where we need to go next? And at the end of the day, a, a really successful outcome could very well mean that only three or four different bills, um, a plussing up of the budget of a specific DOE program, um, maybe a couple, uh, you know, a couple executive orders or broad statements are emitted, that would be considered a quite successful outcome. Thank you. Do you have a, uh, a, a bill this year that passed, that got signed, that, that, that you're proud of? I mean, I, what happened this year after all? This year was, this year was a difficult year. Um, I will be frank on that. And uh, the, level of, the level of log jam was was intense. COVID, of course, raised the stakes on everything and made it very hard to legislate around different areas. Um, but I know that the Alliance does point to a number of successes across the board. 
um, appropriations for you know, the programs of the Department of Energy that do research and development in transportation received very nice numbers. Um, we saw a lot of talk around the EV tax credit and where that would go next. It's still in a sort of static place. There are some looming big questions about the highway trust fund and what is to happen with that, but it's kind of a political hot potato that will burn anybody who makes a strong statement on. Um, so nobody's really fighting for the, the right to that one. Um, but I'd say overall, you know, there, was, there have been a number of packages that have moved forward that had good things in them. Uh, but we really are hopeful that next year with FAST Act authorization, with some of the stimulus funding coming through, that we can see, uh, see more successes. And I, I suppose, I mean, you know, obviously we, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with Congress, but it may be not too different than this year, but the, there'll be a new administration. So what, does, what is your expectation, how that changes things? There's a lot of talk about that in this town. I wish I had a crystal ball, I don't. It's very likely there will still be some, some log jam. Uh, you have a divided government. Um, whether the Senate is slightly blue or slightly red could make a big difference. At the same time, um, the hopeful part of me wonders if this is also an opportunity for us to sort of rekindle a little bit of that view of bipartisanship. Um, I sincerely believe that the recommendations that we put forth in this work, advancing electrification, um, you know, considering the future impacts of automation, making cities more efficient overall, transit, et cetera, are not red or blue priorities. And you see that mimicked at the state levels. Very often, electrification is not a super partisan issue. There are a lot of, a lot of Republicans that support electrification great opportunity to make electric vehicles, export opportunity. Other countries are driving their sectors forward quickly because they want to own that international market. Um, it creates jobs in local neighborhoods. It, you know, if governments are using electric buses, it lowers their expenditures. It creates economic growth. There's really so many good reasons for it. But I think um, because of the sort of symbolic nature that the partisanship has taken uh, in the National Congress, some things have gotten trapped that really shouldn't, shouldn't have been. And I think, um, one of the best things that could happen this year is if we would depoliticize some of these policy areas where all sides could benefit. Well, it's certainly, you know, a good time to be hopeful and uh, at least be new energy, so to speak, going into some of these things. So mm -hmm. election years are tough. It's hard to think, get a lot to happen. So do we have any other questions? It's gone quiet. This is your last chance to put something out there. I'll, I have one more, just I'll throw out. Um, I mean, to be blunt, in the last four years, you almost couldn't even use the word climate. It's been, I mean, at least as far as the national politics goes and, and DC politics, that presumably is gonna change. What? How has that affected you guys, I mean, you're about energy. That gives you sort of an advantage. As you said earlier, you can talk about saving energy and it, it can mean different things to different people. You don't really have to talk about climate, but presumably climate's gonna be back front and center um, mm -hmm. in the new administration. So, you know, what, how has that been? And has that hindered you much to not, or ha have you avoided talking about climate or, you know, how is that all playing out and how do you expect it to, to go in, you know, into next year? It's a great question. Um, we do tend to focus much more on the energy, the energy efficiency, energy productivity terminology over climate, and that is a conscious decision. It comes back again to our mission and vision, really, which is to work towards a world with greater energy productivity. Um, but we do view climate as one of the greatest drivers of energy efficiency and the reason why we should be doing it. Energy efficiency, um, and again, I'm, I'm using a very broad, <laughs> broad definition of energy efficiency here where I'm including electrification um, and optimization of energy. Doing that is one of the best things we can do to reduce our climate emissions. And it often is the lowest cost. It's often the most effective. It is often the most distributed. There are a number of benefits depending on which sector you're looking at that really should appeal to everybody. So we're very happy to talk about energy efficiency as your first thing out of the gate um, to address the climate crisis. And we believe that is extremely firm, uh, but we generally do not step, step onto a stage and say, it is our prerogative and our mission as the organization to reduce climate emissions because that's the secondary piece 
um, for us. It is a driver. And um, increasingly, the more that the, you know, the more that the tide turns and we're talking constantly about climate change. And I will say that while many Republicans wouldn't necessarily want to sign on to a Green New Deal or, you know, make themselves, a, you know, put themselves out there in terms of, you know, promoting climate legislation directly. Uh, we had plenty of conversations with Republicans on the Hill who said, yeah, we know it's a problem. How do we solve it in a way that really is a, an effective use of taxpayer dollars? How do we solve it in a way that really, that really works without blowing the deficit? So there were, there were a lot of really productive conversations and a lot of really productive thoughts. I think the question is just, is there a political environment where we can really have those conversations in a meaningful way? Great. So, okay, we have one more. Maybe we'll make this our last one. Uh, it's from Trisha again. Back to you, Trisha. Go ahead and ask it. <clears throat> Hi, yeah, I, my question was about the organization or hierarchy of the Alliance, but I noticed that Tesora beat me to a question. Um, so I, I can give him the No, 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 that's question. fine. Go ahead, Trisha, yeah. Um, oh yeah, I missed Tesora's. We can go to Tesora after, sorry. I, I'm so I noticed you said that there are sitting members of Congress that are um, I forgot the what what the term was but like how how are they involved in the day to day activities like what is their role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they they are basically like honorary advisors. Um, so if you're familiar with how board dynamics work, if you have sort of an honorary board member, um, it's you know it basically means that they're as involved as they want to be. Um, some of our honorary uh, honorary board are really involved all the time and really excited and we work with their staff on a regular basis. Others join us for major events and you know they sort of serve as our sounding board to come in and say we'd really like to get this across the line. What do you think? Um, how do we do this? And they can be very supportive in those ways as well. And others are just a little more distant. It's the, the natural, natural distribution. And um, I can go ahead. Uh, Tasura, do you want to read your question? No, that's fine. I think it's straightforward. You know, how does relations with China? Right. I actually don't have much of a comment on that because we do focus on the U.S. sector at the Alliance. Uh, we're primarily a, a U.S. domestic organization. Um, but I will say that one thing that did come up regularly was the fact that China is moving very assertively and um, holistically, enthusiastically, towards developing a lot of these technologies. And so for those who are interested in the jobs impacts of electrification, there is, there is a bit of a first mover uh, race going on. There is a competitive aspect to the industry. And that is a message that really resonates uh, with a lot of folks on the Hill and understanding that there is such thing as the US missing the boat on this and not being the creator of that next industry. And that would affect US job, the US job market for a very long time to come. Um, oh, okay, there's a hand raise, which I wasn't spotting from Ray. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask a question, Ray? Sure. Uh, thank you, Lou. Thank you, Natasha. Your presentation for me was really uh, informative and eye-opening. My question is, I always want to know what is my role and how can I play it correctly and effectively. Since you, your organization is a bipartisan organization and you are dealing with different oppositions and all this different views, what do you suggest for us to, um, how we can, I guess my question is, how we can be a good advocate for, for these policies when we deal with public or where we, we deal with our neighbors who are you know, opposing these new deals and opposing climate change and opposing these realities that we are living in, how, how we can you know, advocate, I think the best term for it, for, for solutions. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question. Um, and I suspect there will be a couple of dissertations written on that question just this year. Um, but I would say that at the end of the day, everybody has some of the same values. You know, no matter, no matter the, the position, no matter where one is coming from, there are some shared values. And the question is, how can you speak to those shared values? Another thing I would say is that there is such thing as having folks with whom it would take too much work too much time, 
and be too unproductive to really try to reach agreement, right? There is such thing as needing to choose your group and choose the network of folks that can help you move something forward. And sometimes diluting it too much with naysayers can make it so that it's very hard to move anything. Um, there is a, um, a bit of, a, of an offhanded insult in the world that I operate in that something is just a lowest common denominator initiative, which is to say an organization had too many different groups in it and all they could agree to was the lowest common denominator as opposed to something really truly visionary. Um, one can also defend that lowest common denominator initiatives do also bring value. It does move a group forward and hopefully the lowest common denominator is actually slightly higher than, than what it sounds like it was, but it is a fair judgment, right? What does it take to inspire people to move beyond their comfort zone to do something more meaningful. So if you're talking about the example of really trying to decarbonize, um, how do we move more quickly and decisively if not, you know, not all Americans agree that we should move quickly and decisively? Um, what do we do if, if you know, a majority of Americans believe in climate change but don't necessarily think we should spend money on it or incur costs to address it? Um, so again, you know, I think it comes down to find the shared values, find the spaces where you have a potential to even build trust between, between the individuals, the organizations, find areas where you can work together and that can only help when the next challenge comes down the road and you're, you're used to being on the same side. Great. Yeah, believe in climate change. That's uh, I don't I don't actually like that because uh, it's not a belief system. But I know what you mean. Uh, it's more like acknowledging the science. But we we do have a, a almost a 50-50 split on that one, and that that makes things that's going to make things uh, tricky, and it makes it hard to talk about it with people. So I think that's. Um, that's it. I don't see anyone else. Um, so maybe we'll turn it back over to you, Natasha, to do your, uh, I think you're calling it a tabletop exercise, right? That's right. Excellent. Thank you okay, so much. Go for it. Um, so your leaders gave me the indulgence of letting me do something a little bit unusual. I know a lot of folks are kind of exhausted by the Zoom webinars and all of the remote learning. Um, the same is true for those of us who are, you know, attending conferences and, and uh, roundtables and webinars constantly by Zoom. So I wanted to make this just a little bit more interactive. I understand that those folks who are just dialing in, who are not actual registered participants of the class, um, this might not be as interesting for you because I'm actually going to send all of the students um, elsewhere. So I'm calling this a tabletop exercise. Uh, in the military, in the, in the Pentagon, there is a group of people who organize something called a tabletop exercise in which they get all of these really important government stakeholders in different positions together and say, okay, you know, a bomb just went off in, you know, the Empire State Building or a hurricane has just knocked out the power grid in Houston. What do you do? What's the first thing you do? And it forces people to take on different roles and say, you are the power operator, you are the such and such, you are the such and such. Who do you talk to? What do you do about it? How do you resolve that problem? And the exercise shows that even operating in the world of a large bureaucracy can be very, very challenging. So this isn't quite a tabletop exercise because you would need to be in person in a room. Um, this always works better in person in a room, but I hope that we can capture a little bit of the interest um, by doing this remotely. So your scenario is the following. It's January 20th, 2021. Uh, so it's next year, new Biden administration's being sworn in. Your objective is pretty simple, to decarbonize transportation nationally as rapidly and as effectively as you can. Um, you will assume the role of one stakeholder and there are four options. You're either gonna be in the US Congress, you're gonna be in the White House, you're gonna be a business association, or you're gonna be a nonprofit that's dedicated to decarbonization. You're gonna be given a few choices that will guide your approach. And I'll flag that each of the choices you are being given is somewhat imperfect. And in reality, most organizations would probably take a collection of choices or a combination or a completely different choice, but that's not the exercise. The exercise is you're being given choices that are slightly imperfect and have pros and cons. So I see that Natalie has already identified who's in each of the four groups. Depending on which group you are, please go to the Google document. And I believe Natalie is also gonna be posting the Google document links for each of those groups in just a second. Um, once you get into the Google document, you will see 
um, the document that I've written explaining to you who you are, what you care about, and the choices that you have about approaching this problem. You will note that there is a little, this little icon um, that shows a, a circle with a little person, a little three little dots on it. That is actually the chat function. You touch that and you will be able to chat with the others on your group. Um, so work with your group to select your top choice, discuss the implications of your choice uh, through the chat function, select one person to be your spokesperson per group to present your conclusions to the rest of the group, and we'll call you back, back in about 10 minutes. So feel free to leave your cameras or leave yourself uh, on this call. You don't need to hang up. Um, just go ahead and take a look at the Google Docs. And if you have any questions, I'll be here. Natasha, let me just ask on behalf of people. So you're, the, each group is discussing and choosing their top, is it their top policy? Is that? So each of the documents basically provides them with three different options for how they can try to decarbonize quickly. One is a go hard and fast, one is an intermediate, and one is a slower option. And based on which organization it is, I've tailored the language slightly for each of them. And you're coming at it from the perspective of your stakeholder group. That's right. Okay. So you are President Biden. You are concerned about X, Y, Z. Here are the options. How aggressive do you want to be on climate change? If you're Congress, are you a particular political party or are you somehow a amalgamation of political parties? You're the chair of the TNI committee. Ah, uh, okay. Just to clarify, um, because this is a webinar format, we are not, um, we don't have the capacity to break into groups. Um, so as Natasha mentioned on your uh, Google shared doc, there is that comment feature and um, which is still up. Um, you can, there's a chat function where you can chat. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. And then um, I believe I captured everyone. Uh, if I missed someone, let me know and we can plug you into a group, but I think you guys are good. Okay, thanks. All righty. Could I hear from somebody who can speak for the group that was in Congress? Tell us who you were and what your choice was and why. Anybody out there, group one? Nobody? Did they, did they definitely select a spokesperson? Not totally clear. Maybe, maybe they all need to select a spokesperson. It's possible in any case. Um, maybe I'll give group one another few minutes to, uh, to get together. Group two. Have a spokesperson? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So awesome. You um, so it was kind of, I'm sorry. Oh, um, it was kind of difficult to get a consensus, but I mean, on the page, we overall agreed on going to towards in incremental activist approach. Um, and some of the things that people mentioned uh, in regards to like a ice ban of vehicles uh, by 2035 was kind of like too much. Um, uh, so yeah, th those are some of the. And just to clarify, group two was, was Vice Pres or was President Biden um, yeah. in the White House. Yeah. And the question was, do you take a very aggressive stance um, regarding climate change and ban ICE vehicles and really move quickly and assertively uh, with sort of the highest level of target setting that's out there? Or do you go with something more incremental where you try to pick a couple hard things and negotiate fiercely about it? Or do you do this sort of slow and steady approach? So you guys have chosen the second approach. What do you think is the, the greatest risk of that approach? 
Um, like anything, I think there's a balance. Um, some people probably will say that um, it's not aggressive enough and that our goals need to be reached uh, within a short amount of time, whereas other people might think that uh, that our goals are too stringent and um, our demand too much and that we need to, you know, for example, expand the ice band further out to a later uh, date and time. Okay, thank you. All right, group three. Another one more? Oh, can I add one more? Oh, yes. So uh, one risk of uh, choosing option B or intermediate or approach could be uh, that while we want to apply more progressive uh, approaches uh, that has that has a success uh, in California or New York, uh, uh, more progressive cities. So we have seen that there are a major division between the regions, uh, mid Central America or other, you know, more rural area and the more progressive progressive cities. So that uh, applying uh, kind of a uniform uh, restrictions or uh, policy could raise uh, more division between the two uh, regions or two, uh, you know, Democrats and uh, Republicans. Yes, thank you for that. Um, very helpful. Okay, group three. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, are we in group three or group four? Three. Three, okay. Three is business association, right? Business association. And if, if you guys didn't get to nominating a speaker, if someone from the group would just give, give feedback, that would be great. We only have a few minutes, so. Yeah, oh. so for group three, we decided to go with the incremental approach. Um, the reason we did that is because we have a somewhat divided group. Um, so we wanted to make both parts of our automobile association happy. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to preserve the unity of the, the group basically. Um, some people wanna go more into electric vehicles and some people are more into traditional cars, so mm -hmm. yeah. And it is very true for business associations, it can be very hard to lose members. It can be financial death. If you make a, if you try to go too far into a direction that too few of your members are interested in, then you lose members very quickly. And that, uh, that reduces your political power. Um, but it also, you know, you also wanna be seen as a leader. So that's the, that's the tension. Thank you. Uh, group four. Trisha, was that you? Yeah, that, that was our group. Um, so our group was the environmental NGO. Um, we we came to a, a bit of a consensus. Of, so the three approaches we were presented with was, was like very, uh, very uh, aggressive, less aggressive, but tough, and then go to the roots. Um, we uh, we like the tough collaborator and, and root strategy best. Um, I know. Uh, one of the questions was, can we just pick one? Uh, but we, we proposed our own strategy where we have like a bit of all three, mm -hmm. like a very yeah. tough, like a very extreme approach on uh, electric vehicles because that has more bipartisan support, mm -hmm. um, more of a tough collaborator approach on um, things that are maybe less, uh, less popular, but still very important, like... Um, like maybe 100% clean energy or uh, electrifying harder modes like trucks or sorry, making trucks or airplane travel more um, energy efficient. And for and, others in the group, the, the tough collaborator was, was the middle, was the middle option as well. It was sort of the equivalent of the incrementalist in the other, in the other cases. Um, and since, and, uh, and we wanted to, we thought we could propose a, like a grassroots strategy for things that are more in the court of public opinion, like some people don't believe in climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe invest in education and um, write directly to influential communities. So have a strong message, a hard behind the scenes working message, and then work with the grassroots to try to move the whole, the whole needle. Excellent, thank you. Group one, would anybody from group one like to speak? Last chance. 
Sure. Uh, yeah, we were in Congress and we were talking, our subject was EVs. Um, the general uh, intention of the group went to option B, which was medium level of uh, progress. And um, we, we, underst we understood the hardship of um, having having an aggressive attitude to this problem which is which exists right now and we are seeing this problem in Congress um, so we we were toward B which is um, which, which includes um, some part of uh, policies and some part of the problems can be addressed by non-partisanship requirements so we, we will, um, we would like to have those passed and then deal with most um, con 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 uh, controversial um, aspects of it later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Um, really great work, everyone. I see we only have two minutes uh, for the wrap up. So I'll just, I'll just point out, um, first of all, I will say how many of you think that with in this imaginary world in which you all were those stakeholders, would we be able to remain in a two degree Celsius warming world? Are your goals enough to get there? I suspect the answer is probably not. No. Right? <laughs> and yet, because of where you sit, you, there are some very immediate decisions that would undermine your own power and your own ability to get policy passed if you push too hard, too far, too fast, depending on who you are. Um, so this is, the, this is the great tension. And this is a space where greater information, moving public opinion, having really clear analysis that makes the choices extremely clear helps move that debate and helps change quickly uh, what is considered a, a passable step or a manageable step and what is considered sort of too far out. So I'll end with the, um, with the, the definition of the Overton window. It was a, a term that I only recently learned. Uh, some of you may know it, but some of you may not. It is the concept that everybody lives in a world in which you see the political left to right as a sort of window of what you consider normal. Most people think there's the center here and then there's something crazy on the right over there and something crazy on the left over there. Um, so there's a view that for a lot of people, that window is not a static thing. It is not um, objective. It is shaped and formed by our opinions and what we've seen and what we view as normal politics in our democracy. And so that window can be shifted. So if we want to talk very seriously about decarbonization, one of the ideas is to try to shift the Overton window so that more people see some of these basic actions of, on climate change is absolutely centrist, not as a left, a left wing idea, but rather one that is just makes sense for all of us as a society. So greater research analysis, um, whether you're talking about technological research, policy research, um, all of this is helpful to help, you know, make it a clearer point of the kind of message that we need and the kind of policies that we could pursue. So. Uh, my best wishes to all of you, and I look forward to the, the many different great things that you will do over the course of your careers. Back to you, Lou, maybe to close. Sure. Thank you, Natasha. That was fun. Yeah, we all muddled through and picked the middle path, but the middle path ain't going to work for two degrees climate. But anyway, good to, good to experience that. So thank you again. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to learn from that and and see how all of our students go out there and, and do something other than the middle path, maybe. I don't know. All right, thanks everyone. If you figure it out, let us know. <laughs> thank, you. You. thank 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 you.